Hey everyone, welcome to the Cutting Edge Podcast where culture meets crypto. Today we have a photographer and filmmaker who is well known for her successful collaboration with Playboy for The Art of Gender and Sexuality. In 2022, her most recent NFT project, Keepers of the Inn, I Live Here Now, became the first NFT collection to fully finance a feature film and is the largest collection of NFT photography ever sold. She will now be partnering with Super Rare to release her latest collection, Modern Muses. Please welcome Julie Pacino. Hi, Julie. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, the GM. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to to come and chat with us uh, on the show. You know, I I uh, I really appreciate it. Is one of the things is I I really like talking to creators who are disrupting different verticals, and you're the uh, the first uh, filmmaker that we've had on the show. So I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Of, of how this is going to affect the film industry. Amazing. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk about that. And I know that a lot of people feel like this year is poised to be the, the year of film NFTs. And so um, hopefully I'm the first of many that will join you on the show to talk about films and NFTs. Amazing. And, and you know, and before we get into that, you know, I just in, in doing the prep for this, you know, uh, your father's Al Pacino. Uh, you guys, uh, he's a, a huge... Uh, fan of stickball and you know he's spoken about it a couple of times uh in his past interviews uh and you guys used to play stickball together right <laughs> and what what ended up happening there <laughs> oh god um yeah that's hilarious uh we did yeah we so i i actually part of my background is i growing up was a, a huge athlete i got a softball scholarship to ucla and um yeah my dad growing up in the Bronx, you know, played a lot, a lot of stickball. And um, we used to play together in the backyard. He likes to take credit for teaching me everything that I know about swinging a baseball bat. And um, yeah, he used to just kick my ass like I, the, from like ages five until 12. He just would strike me out and win and hit home runs off me. And then like at some point around 12 or 13, the tides turned and I started beating him. And then it was just like, Oh, my back's, my back's sore. I can't play anymore. So um, <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to talk to him about that, but yeah. Right. And, but then you ended up getting a, a scholarship, a softball scholarship to UCLA. I did. Yeah, I did. I, um, so, I played. so it was worth it. It was worth so it. it was yeah. Worth it all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was yeah, definitely no, worth great. it. Mm -hmm. No, that that's awesome. I, I think that's like super important. I, I remember I grew up playing, uh, my dad, I wasn't, I wasn't good at baseball. Baseball was not one of the sports I was good at, but I remember my dad would go and like, you know, on Saturday mornings we'd go and like, he'd pitch me balls and just trying to improve my swing and stuff. So it's really awesome. I think as a dad to kind of see your child really thrive, even, even if you did end up beating him, I'm sure he was super proud. Yeah. And he's, he's a great <laughs> athlete. My mom's also a great athlete too. So I think it's, uh, I think it's in my blood, but sports, sports was great for me. Like it really taught me that kind of like daily grind work, work ethic. Um, mm -hmm. so, so anyway, that's, it, it's part of my foundation and I'm proud of it. And, and I don't, I, I think that if my dad and I were to play stickball today, he might actually have a shot at beating me cause I haven't swung a bat in a long <laughs> time. So I'll give him that. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so I guess with that being said, you know, what was it like, you know, obviously there was, I guess some, I don't know if anything's normal these days, but there was some normality to your growing up in that you, you were able to, to play a sport with your dad and, and learn. And like, you had that like a uh, great camaraderie with your dad. What was it like having a father uh, so well known as you were growing up? You know, it's, it was weird in moments, but I don't know. Like my mom did a great job. Like she always made sure that I knew uh, what the word no means and that I, I wasn't famous. My dad was famous. And, um, you know, obviously like in school, I got picked on a little bit. I think there's like an episode of Friends, which I don't watch that show, but where like Joey is like Al Pacino's butt double. And I just remember getting just like <laughs> absolutely shredded in middle school, Al Pacino's butt, Al Pacino's butt. Um, but you know, it, it was, it was like, I don't know, it was normal for me. I don't, I don't know anything else, but, but one thing that I do know is that, um, growing up exposed to the industry and like hanging out with my dad 
on film sets uh, and just having an, an artist father that's that's <laughs> prolific but really cares about the artwork first. Like my dad is is through and through an artist first and foremost. I mean, he's sort of notorious for for like saying no to roles that don't that don't move him uh, artistically. And so being able to visit sets and just getting exposed to that medium at such a young age, like obviously has shaped my entire life. I mean, I feel like really fortunate to have known that it's something that I want to do, like literally from as far back as I can remember, just being like five years old, wandering around the set of devil's advocate with like burned up corp fake burned up corpses and and beautiful set design and just being like what is this alternate reality that i'm in and i i want to i want to live in this um so that's you know that was really an amazing part of it was just being able to be exposed to those things at such a young age so you so you realized you wanted to work in film from basically your earliest from since when you can remember yeah i mean i as a kid i was like running around with a with a camera directing my friends and <laughs> making little short films they're like can we just go outside and play i'm like no we have to make the shot list uh they're like what are you talking about um but yeah i, I think <laughs> i've always been um i've always been just fascinated by the the this film set that is like this it feels like you're in an imaginary world and you can just go exist there and play in it and it, it, there's a safety to it because you're kind of protected by this screenplay or the fact that it is imaginary and i don't know every kids play dress up and and play house and have them mm -hmm. you know there's an imagination to it and so i just kind of like connected those dots at a young age, so you, like, oh, this, this is what I want so, to do. Sorry. So you always wanted to be behind the, you always knew you wanted to be behind the camera and like not in front of the camera? Yeah, I mean, I did, I doubt, I acted a bit and I actually enjoyed it, um, but I didn't feel like I needed to do it. Like, I think that's the main thing in the film business. It's, it's so gritty and especially being an actor, like it's such a grind and it's constant rejection. Like you really need to love acting to pursue it. I mean, I think you need to love whatever you're doing to pursue it wholeheartedly. And so um, I, I felt that way about being behind the camera and writing. It's just like, I need, I, I, I'm not, I'm doing this because I have to, I have to express uh, through this medium. Um, but, you know, I've acted a little bit and, and it's fun. It's, it, I, I consider it like a hobby, you know? Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's incredible. You know, I, I think also, being on set with, uh, you know, film legends, right? Like both directors and actors, I'm sure you got a lot of um, great advice uh, that these people would tell you uh, growing up. What was, I guess, what was like one or two things that really stuck out to you that uh, you got like at an early age that really stuck with you? I mean, my dad, yeah, it's like, I've got, I've benefited so much from conversations with my dad just because he's, again, just the way that he like views the world and the way that he talks about the artist process. I think the best piece of advice that he's ever given me that I is, has become like religious for me is focus on the work, focus on the art and the rest will follow. So in, not getting hung up on making a bunch of money or wh who's going to like it or where's it going to go. It's just like, just when you're creating, let that be the only thing that is in your conscience and, and everything else will, will fall into place. And, and, you know, that's speaking from his experience, like being homeless growing up and coming from like extreme poverty, but he always knew that some that somehow it would work out because he had his art he had his Shakespeare what he could run his lines and he just you know so like th that's the best piece of advice that he or anyone that I met growing up has given me is just like takes the pressure off entirely is, is make art from the purest place possible yeah and to that point is you know as a as a collector in the space I've gotten the opportunity uh to meet a lot of creators uh, in the NFT community. And one of the things uh, that I always hear a lot over and over from the very successful ones is the same thing, right? Is like the second you start thinking about the commercialization of your art, 
like it, you know, it loses a lot of its purity, right? It's like you create something for you and then hopefully it resonates with somebody. But if it doesn't, as long as it resonates with you, it's really true to who you are as a person, right? Uh, as a creator. So uh, I think that that's really good advice. <laughs> so, yeah, no, uh, as long as there's intention behind what you're doing, I think, you, I don't think you can go wrong. And so when did you get, uh, I guess, start going into the film industry professionally from as a filmmaker point of view, like what was that career path that kind of led you to, to where you are today officially? Like I know you've always been around it since you were a kid, so it's probably really tough to distinguish, but like what was that kind of like first big break that you got? Yeah, I, I, it, I was 19. I was living in Austin, Texas. So, you know, I went to, I went to UCLA my freshman year of college and I got there, we were practicing. It was intense. It, you know, it's like D one sports are insane. And I tore my hamstring and I just like at that point had become kind of burnt on the athletics and the way that the studies were set up. It was like, you could either major in women's studies or history. And like both of those subjects are interesting to me, but I didn't know what I would do with a, a history degree after four years of college. And so I think like I, in a lot of ways I had been like suppressing my artist's filmmaker side. And so I, I hurt my hamstring and I kind of just took it as a sign of like, this is this part, this chapter of my life I think is over and I want to go all in and pursue a film career. And so luckily like UCLA was really cool about it. They let me finish out the year and take some film courses um, and just kind of be like a part of the team in, in whatever way that I wanted. So I, you know, was there, I shot some videos and like, um, you know, obviously had some great friends, but uh, after the year at UCLA, I moved to Austin, Texas sort of randomly, just like not wanting to move back home to New York and, and kind of wanting to, explore a cool creative city on my own. I was 19 years old. And um, so I went to Austin, Texas and was like going to community college, but not really. I was, I, I was never an academic. Like I, I just never liked the structured system of school. Like I, I, I don't, I didn't like people telling me what to do, what to do um, or math, math sucked. Uh, but so I'm in Austin, Texas and I, I, sort of like trying to just meet people in the industry there. It's a, it was a small industry. And um, I started working as a PA on a feature film. Uh, and that was kind of like my in, you know, it was important to me to, to try to get my foot in the door without going through my dad. I kind of, I think I just wanted to prove to myself that it was something I really wanted, wanted to do. And so that was my in, just 19 years old in Austin, Texas, production assistant on a feature film, and then wound up moving back to New York and just continued that trend of just producing nonstop um, music videos, short films, a couple feature films, some theater, just like soaking it up and absorbing and learning filmmaking by doing it in that way. Right. What's the difference between, let's say like the New York uh, acting scene and the LA acting scene and like you know why did you choose New York over LA I mean like you know it's you do know you're bo it's there's a, a certain vibe in New York and um but in terms of the acting I just I think that or the film scene in general film, yeah. right like New York is way it's this is kind of a generalization but I but I think it's true like New York is just way more authentic to and and uh loyal to the process like right there's like a big theater th scene in new york and theater is all about rehearsing which is like we're going to dissect this thing and work it and rehearse it and do it over and over and over again until it's perfect and i am an absolute junkie for the process like i love that that's my favorite part mm -hmm. i love dissecting and putting it back together and doing things over and over again until it's this like beautiful refined version of itself. And I just think that that's more that exists in New York uh, and is easier to access than, than Los Angeles. Um, but also I think right. at that point in time, I was 19 and like, just kind of wanted to be, be experience the city as an adult, you know? Right. And um, yeah. <laughs> and so I had, I had a good time. <laughs> I always knew I wanted to live in New York. Uh, like as a young adult, 
so I went to a college campus experience because I had the chance to go at NYU. But I'm like, you know what? I know I'm going to move here, so I'm going to I'm going to move here after I graduate. And New York as a young adult is I don't know. I wouldn't change that experience for anything in the world. And to your point is uh, living there for so long. I, I lived in Manhattan for 14 years. I was able to meet obviously a lot of actors, comedians, and people. And I, one of the things I always asked was, you know, why are you here and not in LA? And like, it was always interesting to kind of get their answers as to, to why, but a lot of it resonates with, with what you just said, right? Is like, it's, you, you kind of work on your process in New York. And then when you think you're ready, like then you head over to LA or if yeah. that's what you want, right? Cause not everybody wants that, right? Yeah, and I think it's it's fun in LA to to have that New York background because I I feel like I'm just I get <clears throat> so many so much more done in a day than a normal LA person. Like I I just like have that <laughs> New York like no we're, like we're banging out this to do list. So I don't know. It feels it, it feels like I'm moving at hyper speed while people are like a little bit slower here, which. I know I get on people's nerves sometimes because of that, but I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm a fucking New Yorker. Right. Like, <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. Yeah, I, I get that too, where sometimes I feel like I'm not even being that productive and people are like, whoa, you're moving so quickly. And I'm like, I, I don't know. It's just like that New York, like chutzpah, I guess, right? Like, it's, <laughs> yeah, like New exactly. Yorkers have it, right? <laughs> yeah, nonstop. <laughs> um, but yes, so so yeah, I, I'd love to know what have, what, what have your experiences uh, as a woman in the film industry been like? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's been interesting because my path has, like, I have this sort of passport, like my last name is, is opens a lot of doors. And I think that, um, it's, it's, there's a certain privilege that I've had, which, which has been awesome. And I've gotten a lot of great meetings that I think, other independent filmmakers wouldn't have had the chance to get. And, you know, th that can be a double-edged sword though. I think sometimes like that, in my experience that had, that acted against me or people or will make assumptions about me before, um, before they even meet me and not give me the chance to like express, like talk about my art and, you know, I'm expressed that I genuinely want to be doing this. And so, um, you know, it's, it's tough as a woman. I think that like, it's, it is a very male driven space and that like, while I've been able to cut the, to the front of some lines, like I still have had that feeling of my voice, you, you know, like not being really heard or just being heard because they have to take the meeting. And, and, um, and it's frustrating, you know, it, it can feel like a boys club and it can feel very gate kept. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think that I, one of the beautiful things about NFTs uh, and what I like about crypto in general is that it's a very much uh, a meritocracy, right? It's like, if you, if you have good ideas, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what your race or gender is, right? It's like, you have a good idea and you're a contributor you you have the same access to capital and the formation of capital and all this infrastructure that might otherwise be gate kept from you in a traditional system. I, exactly. That's like so perfectly <laughs> put. I, I also like, I was onboarded into this space by a man and I, I feel like in my experience, pretty much across the board, like the men in this space are willing to help and willing to listen and want to want equality and want to elevate women and so i think for me that's what sets it apart from uh from hollywood or from other industries is that there's not like the virtue signal signaling exists but it's it's there's less of it there's just i don't know there's just like way more authenticity in the space and that's not I know there are people that, that suck that virtue signal that are full of shit, but um, I've just somehow been lucky enough to, uh, to primarily come across really great men that, that want truthfully to have equality and to highlight underrepresented voices. Right. Yeah. And I agree. I think one of the cool things uh, about NFTs a lot, like over the last few months is, how people, you know, crypto is predominantly male, right? Because of the way uh, like school works and the way, you know, programmers are usually male dominated. So it was already kind of like a, a very like, uh, 
like traditional kind of in the same way that like distribution of, of male of men to women. And I think one of the cool things about NFTs has been that like people have been just advocating for more equality, right? Like how do we onboard more people of color? How do we onboard more women and non-binary people? And, and that I think has been really cool. I think we, have, we still have, obviously uh, it's a never ending journey, right? And people always have to be advocating for it, but it makes me really, really happy like to step back for a second and be like hey like you know we're on the right path right like you know could things be better things could always be better but uh i do think that every once in a while you have to kind of as a community it's good to take a step back and be like hey like we are doing good shit you know like you know and we can be proud of our accomplishments of of fighting for equality uh within the space yeah absolutely yeah and, and so i guess along those you just said that you were onboarded by by a man into crypto. How did you first hear about crypto? And I guess more specifically, how did you, how did you hear about NFTs and then realize the possibility of what you could do with NFTs? I mean, I, I heard about crypto in like 2011. Like I had the crazy friend that was like, you gotta buy Bitcoin. And <laughs> we were all like, shut the fuck up. And, and he was right. And you know, so um, that's when I first heard about crypto, but I, I got like reintroduced to it about a little over a year ago. Um, w- my friend who, who also grew up in, in Rockland County, Will Savis, um, had, I, I had started to post more frequently photographs that I was taking on Instagram. Like for a while I was very inactive, but I had this kind of library of photographs that I'd taken over the course of several years because part of my filmmaking process is to take photographs during rehearsals uh, just as a way to like get everyone comfortable with the camera to sort of start sketching out shots. And I just like taking photos. It it, it was always kind of this hobby thing. And so my, my, one of my best friends and now manager was like encouraging me to post more of my photos on Instagram. He's like, these are great photos. They're just sitting here. Like, why don't you share them? And so, um, you know, I was not confident in them, but I, I started posting them more on Instagram. And so then Will Savis, who's a friend since, you know, high school saw me posting these photos. And this was, I guess, in like February of last year. And he reached out to me and told me about Justin Aversano and NFTs and was like, there's, I, I, he was predicting that photography was going to start to take off in this space. And he really liked my artwork and, um, you know, told me to, to take a look at NFTs and let him know if I wanted to be involved. And of course, at first it was, the idea of it was confusing and you know, I, I, I was just like, I, who would want to buy a JPEG of my artwork? Like it just didn't make sense. And so I started like slowly doing some research and listening in and, and learning and, you know, having multiple calls with Will to like explain to me what things meant. And, um, I think once I, once the block, the concept of like art of ownership on the blockchain like at some point that clicked for me and and then I was kind of like all right this is this is something I want to pursue and so Will really helped me put together my first collection and it was a photo a, a series of 100 photographs that I had taken at the Madonna Inn uh hotel and those photos had inspired the screenplay for what's going to be my first feature film. And so the idea came of like, well, why don't we do a collection of these photos? And within the collection, I can kind of talk about um, how taking photos led to me discovering characters and then wanting to write a script based off of those characters and those photos. And so I dropped my Genesis collection in August and was like, hadn't done like a ton of community building was kind of like shy and uh, just, again, just like watching from sort of afar. And, um, and I dropped my first collection and like, we sold out in under 30 minutes. And I was instantly getting hit up by, by my collectors who were I was having like these engaging, amazing conversations with with art people who were like, I just felt like finally seen and heard. Like I'm I'm like having conversations with people who bought my 
artwork and wanted to talk about it and wanted to know about the characters and the movie and what does this mean and here's what I think it means and it was just like this this overwhelming abundance of of excitement and connection and that's really why I make art is to connect like I love I just love connecting with people and talking about art and talking about the process and um and so at that point I was just like a hundred percent obviously in I'm just like this is absolutely the way um and then in a in like a two-week span I I got selected for the time build a better future drop and so I shot a photo for that and um I don't think I've slept since August but so I'm just like <laughs> I've just been like eating you know just non-stop with it but yeah that's how that's how I got involved I think the thing that that intrigued me was the blockchain ownership and then the thing that made me stay was honestly the community right yeah and so you know I I we're really going to dive into that in a little bit, but I guess, so people have a, an idea, right. Uh, of how like the film industry works. I just want to ask you a couple of basic questions, just, you know, for my knowledge as, as well as for others, um, you know, as an advocate for, for artists, I feel that owning your IP is extremely important. Can you explain how IP distribution works in filmmaking? Yeah. I mean, it really depends on, the project and the filmmaker and whoever is distributing it um that this is what we love about it like in in hollywood it's it's usually the studio that retains the ip and and owns everything and profits the most in and in independent film typically it's the filmmaker who retains the ip but what i've started to see happening over the past couple years is the investors demanding ownership. And that's really one of the things that started frustrating me. It's like, why do you want to own my creation? Why should you have final cut on my vision? And I think that that's, that it just isn't, it just isn't fair and it's not Right. And so, uh, you know, to answer your question, it, it does depend on the project in the studio system. It's it's typically the studios and in the indie world, it used to be the filmmakers. But I am I'm seeing that change dramatically at a rapid pace. So in the indie world, is it's moving more towards the studio model. From what I've experienced. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. OK. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah, so then I guess. Is. So I guess NFTs are coming in at a, at a great time, right? Because, you know, like how, how do you see uh, NFTs di disrupting the status quo for the overall industry? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it is honestly perfect timing. I think like the giving the power back to the artist feels like what Web3 is all about. And that is the antithesis of Hollywood it's it is i think there's a real big a, a huge disconnect between the studio system and the mainstream audiences i think that they're they they're repackaging and remaking and distributing stuff that has sold in the past so they're just it it feels lazy i think that the mainstream audiences can be trusted to want to consume thoughtful content. And I, in my experience, web three proves that mm -hmm. directly. I mean, I raised the money for my art house horror film within the NFT community. I now have a community of people where it's proven that they want to consume this type of content. And so th that's how web three can disrupt the film business is just it's a it is a proven case study that when an artist is in full control of their vision good things can happen right and so i i want to delve into that for a second there it's uh so keepers of the inn was your first drop right the photography drop keepers of the inn technically was my third drop so i live here okay. now the, is okay. my genesis okay. drop of 100 photos and then that's the okay. name of the feature okay and so you fi you finance the feature film with the drop yes keep keeper okay. with keepers of the end so i dropped i live here now in august 
Um, and I was like going about raising the money for the screenplay that's based off of that drop, uh, tr the traditional way, meeting with equity investors. Uh, I got a distribution company on board, Utopia Films, that's, they're badass and amazing. But I was having these really frustrating meetings with equity investors where they were just like, again, trying to control my vision, wanting Final Cut, asking me why I'm not casting my dad in it, in a movie about a girl who's at, got pregnant and wants to, doesn't know what to do. I'm like, there's not a role for my dad in this movie. <laughs> um, and so I was getting frustrated with that. And then it, it the idea clicked for me after my amazing spirit experience with my Genesis collection of like, Oh, well, why don't I just go back to the people who already are interested in this film and put together a large scale drop that can finance my movie and not only mm -hmm. finance my movie, like part of our utility is also to onboard more women filmmakers into this space to show them that this is a viable way to do it. And so that's when I came up with the idea for keepers of the Inn, which we, which was a large scale photography drop. It's about 3,400 photos. I took those photos during the rehearsal process of the 16 most pivotal scenes in the movie. So we just went to the Madonna Inn with the script, five actresses in character the whole time. Like we, we stayed there for three days and I just shot nonstop. And we just like, again, like, like I was talking about at the beginning, just like existed in this imaginary world and, and had a blast. And so the drop consists of those photos that I took. Uh, that's amazing. Walked. And and how much money did you raise? It was 296 ETH, I believe. Um, so we, the budget of the film is under a million. We, it's like budget, film budgets are always kind of like a, a shifting thing and they're dependent on factors, but it's mm -hmm. going to be less than a million. And so like, luckily we, we, from this drop, we have what we need to be able to make the movie and to also launch this grants program. That's part of our utility to uh, fund and produce some short format work for other female filmmakers and then um, be able to mint those works and like curate them as part of a Keepers of the Inn special short film grant. Right. And is there any, also, is there any extra utility to the token holders? Like, is there, I assume that there's no equity component or is it, is it like kind of like, it's like a, we're backing uh, you and your cause and your vision, uh, but not necessarily giving up any financial rights. So it's, yeah, like there's, there's all sorts of fun perks. Like I think the main one is involving the community directly in my creative process. So like we have biweekly town halls where I just literally tell the whole community where I'm at and I bounce ideas off people. Like that was an important, exciting thing for me. Just again, going back to the stimulating conversations I was having, it's like, oh, cool. Now I have a community of like co-producers that, like my work that understand my work and that I can just bounce things off of that's valuable. It's like having a market screening before you've even shot a film. You can kind of gauge what the, what is working with the audience. Um, in terms of the like financial side, there are, that's an ongoing conversation because there's, there are like security issues and things that I'm not that, that lawyers know that I don't. Cause I'm just like, I want to, I, I want to give this movie to the holders at the end of it. Like I want everyone to own it. And so, but there's like loopholes that we're working on. And so I, I wouldn't say that that's out of the picture. I think that there are ways where you can kind of like funnel the profit, the profits into a DAO and, and there's, there's coins and stuff. And so we're trying to figure that out. But at this point in time, no, there's, there's no, there's no equity ownership involved in holding a token. But there will be right, and, and to to touch uh, to touch on that point that that you just said about having like a group of uh, of co-producers, right, that you can bounce ideas off of. I think that's one of the most interesting things I've seen. You know, I've had uh, Neil Strauss and I've had Ben Mesrick on the show in the past, and you know, these guys are very prolific writers. That obviously, you know, they, they've been very successful. They don't probably they probably don't need much input from people because they they have their process down really well. But one of the cool things that they've been doing is kind of doing exactly what you're doing with film, but doing it with their books, like almost like a writer's room where at certain points or, or maybe, you know, not for the entire book, but maybe be like, okay, well, what do we do here? Like, I, I'd love some input from the community and, and stuff like that and playing around. So I, I do think it kind of adds an interaction feature, an interactive feature uh, to the process, right? Where it's like, 
the film itself is kind of like the final output. Whereas up until now, like the journey begins with, I'm a consumer, I sit down and I watch the movie and that's the beginning of my journey. And maybe that could be like the middle of the journey instead of the beginning, right? Where it's like, I'm involved in the process. Uh, I kind of know what's coming, but like, I'm also excited to see the final, the final feature, right? Yeah, it, uh, that's so cool. I didn't know that about uh, about the writing rooms and stuff. That's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just think it's cool to be able to like lift the curtain and see behind the scenes and the process of making a film. Like I, 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 I as a, the film industry can be sort of like, there's like a certain mystique to it, I think, for, for, like as an out, yeah an outside perspective. It's like, whoa. And, and it, so it's fun for me to just share like exactly what goes into making a movie. Like it's fucking hard. It takes time. There's a lot of twists and turns. And, and, um, and so, yeah, like when I was building the, the utility for this drop, I just, it was like about what I would want, what I would want if I was buying a token that was helping support a film. It's like, I want to, I want to know what's going into the making of this thing that way when I see it I, I know all the like there's like little easter eggs and I know oh my god that's that scene that she was having an issue with and we helped her figure out and it's just like I, I just I just think that that adds more depth and enhances the experience of seeing the final product it's just fun right yeah no I agree and you know to to your point about the opaqueness of the film industry right like we always see the opening credits where they're always so long and you know, usually uh, people, at, at least I speak for myself, like I recognize like the main actors and then you see like the list of like producers, executive producers and like all this other stuff that I'm, I'm drawing blanks of, of what they even are. It's like, but all these people are like really pivotal to the filmmaking process, right? And it's like, kind of like, you know, what does it look like when you open the curtain? Because as of right now, it's like, I just know it's like, all right, well, you know, Batman just came out last week. I just go there and I sit down and I watch Batman, right? Like, you know, yeah. I would love to know, oh yeah, like the the director was having trouble with this and then this is how they solved it. And like, I, I think it just adds an extra element to to the interactivity and thus like the enjoyment of the final product. Totally. It's, um, anyway, yeah, just to your point, like it's just so cool to see something go from an idea to on the big screen. Like that's just fascinating. Like it's like, oh my God, we were having a conversation about that and now I'm watching it. I just, I love the evolution of that and, and um, seeing, seeing a vision manifest, you know, it's just, it's really, right. and, and I feel like web three is, a, is, is into that, like the process and the journey, you know, that, that, that right. the journey is, that's the, that's the fun of it is, is the journey. Cause then once it's done, right. it's like, it's, it's done, it's made. Now there's what else, or what are we making next? You know? Exactly. And, and you know, it, it's funny just thinking about that, right? It's like it, it adds that you see this a lot with, uh, with movies that have been adapted from books. And you see especially a lot, I feel like you see this with comic books, where the really like the, the, the fans that really know the details will be like, oh, well, they messed up on this or that was really cool and blah, blah, blah. And I think it adds to that, which kind of adds to the community building around the film and, and you as the creator yourself. That's such a good point. I, I actually had not thought about that. That's so true. It's like when you watch a movie that's been adapted, a lot of times the filmmakers will even put in little winks or nods, you know, like in even I know we're like now you have me thinking about Batman, but like in in the dark night, as soon as we, I heard Harvey Dent, I'm like, oh, that's going to be Two-Face. Like, it's just those those mm -hmm. those things about it um, are super fun. And yeah, like I I love that. And I intend on doing that, like just throw, throwing in these little nods that only my community will know. It's, and that just right. like enhances the lore of the whole thing. Game right. Yeah, no, in a way. I agree. And I think that's like something super cool and fun uh, to look forward to and kind of, it, it will just draw people in. Right. And I think people will, will want to get motivated. I, I think it's something I just thought about just now, as we were discussing, I'm like, wow, like that's, that's really cool in like, a great way to develop this strong community around your work. Totally. Yeah. I love that. You know, and, and so, you know, I, one question I have is I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are, are people interested in film, uh, filmmakers themselves. What is the best strategy and, or what tips would you want to share with the audience 
for filmmakers that are coming into Web3? Yeah, I mean, like, definitely the obvious ones of just get on Twitter and listen to spaces and research and, you know, absorb as much information as possible. I think the the main tip for me, the main tip is is figure out your reason why. Like, have an answer to that question. Like, why are you wanting to make this movie as an NFT? Um, that is, that for me is the most important thing is just have a reason. Uh, I think the community responds well to that. I think it's the most, it, 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 to have an authentic approach. Um, and it's just, it just is the most important thing. It's like, don't just come. And I know that there are producers. I know for a fact that there are producers coming to just, Oh, there's money here and it's an easy way to get my thing made. It's like, I'm a big advocate for preserving the integrity of the artwork. It means a lot to me. I poured my soul into keepers of the Inn. I want it. I took beautiful photos. I edited every single one of them because I wanted the token holders to yes, like have access to this filmmaking process, but also just to have like a beautiful NFT that stands alone as a work of art. And that's not the easy way to do it. That's not the quick way to do it. But I, I think that it's the way to do it that will have the longest lasting effect. And so for any filmmakers that are coming in, just it's like my advice is to figure out why you want to do it as an NFT and to really give back to your community in that way in, in ensuring that the NFT has some sort of artistic value and purpose behind it um that i that's an ideal like I, that i i know that that won't be, be the case across the board like i know some studios will fucking come in and make <laughs> a thousand tickets that all look the same and will sell out but i think and i can't control that but i certainly will continue to uh speak about it and and you know share my thoughts on it the art is the art has to come first and um, and figuring out the reason why you're, you want to make your film as uh, within this community and, and as an NFT or with NFTs is essential. Right. And, and to your point is I've, I've had plenty of conversations with, uh, either filmmakers or, uh, producers, or, you know, I don't know exactly what part of the process they were involved in, but, you know, they see the money in NFTs and they're like, oh, like, how can I add this as like a revenue stream to, the, the filmmaking process, right? Because they're thinking about it from a profit perspective. And those conversations to me, I've been very like uninterested in where I'm just like, you know, yeah. good luck. Like this, you know, I because the way I operate is like, you know, I don't want to be involved in anything. Like I want to be proud of everything I put my name on, right? So when I'm involved, when I'm talking to a creator, it's like, okay, well, you know, what what are you doing that's really cool, right? Like, and what's your intention? Because there, you know, we, we see it. Uh, already where there's a lot of projects that come in straight for the money uh, and it sucks, right? Because they're not true. They're not, they're not here to build. Right. And like, I want to fuck with people that are here to build that want to build the community in their respective verticals, right? Like what you're doing in filmmaking is amazing. Like we've been seeing the same thing happen in the art, in the, like the traditional art world, the digital art world now, and, you know, in book writing. And, you know, it's like, to me, it's like, how can you help empower creatives like yourself that maybe didn't have the platform that you did 10 years ago uh, because studios are shutting you out because they don't like what you like. I, I always come back. It's funny. Cause like sometimes when I watch like a major movie, I'm like, who green lighted this movie, right? Like this is a <laughs> terrible movie. Uh, like with a terrible premise, like I could have told you that this was going to be a flop yet somehow <laughs> yeah. it gets produced. Right. And it's like, why aren't those, those marketing dollars and that budget, put for something good, right? Like, you know, you see independent films all the time that, you know, don't have the same production that, you know, a major a blockbuster does, but like the story is incredible. And the story, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about like effects and production value. It's about stories and, and sharing like your perspective that really resonate with the audience. Yeah. And that's like what you're saying, I think is 
to my point about the disconnect between studios and audiences, right? You're like, I would have told you that that movie was going to suck. And it's like, yeah, but is this in the studio's mind, it's like, well, it has this famous person in it. And like the famous person's shooting a gun and there's like sex and things explode. And so like it will work. And it's just, <laughs> it's not thoughtful. Uh, it's not thoughtful at all. But yeah, and and if for people coming in to the space, if your intention is just to, make money I don't know like I kind of feel like it well, at least just own that just be it be authentic with that and let people decide like if if Batman came in and wanted to do nfts and that had some sort of utility and they're just like we're literally coming to get your money like I might buy a Batman nft like I fucking love Batman <laughs> and like so it's just like I don't know just having a reason having a reason why is so important it just is right and I think just being up front to your point, right, is like some people are okay, right? It just it just determines like how much I want to spend, right? It's like would I buy like five – would I spend $5 on like a random Batman thing if I thought it was cool and like I, I liked it? Sure, but like would I spend $5,000 on it? Probably not, right? So I, it, as long as you're, you're, you're pure with your – or actually up front with your intentions, then I think that the consumer – it's up to the consumer to decide what they're willing to spend, right? Yeah, I mean it's that's a big ask to to ask for like the studios to be honest, but like I don't know, I can one can hope. Yeah, so I guess um, you know I, I'm sure you've had a couple conversations. What what are your thoughts about the studios coming to the space, and you know have you been talking to them on helping them guide them with like having the right uh, strategy, the right intentions, right? Cause like, again, a lot of them I'm sure are seeing the space and they're like, Oh, here's another way for us to just make money. But you know, if they come in and kind of do a cash grab type thing, they're not going to be in the space that much longer. And, you know, they probably get a salty taste of, Oh, NFTs are like a scam because they'll probably get like a lot of backlash of people attacking them for what they did. Right. And so to me, it's like one of the things that I'm trying to work on is like, how can I help these major brands have a at least moderately successful entry into Web3? Because then that's going to increase their adoption, right? If they are like, oh, like, you know, this this didn't go the w exactly the way we want, but it wasn't a total flop. So, okay, maybe if we tweak these couple of things, the next time we do it, it'll be better, right? Because it's a learning process for them. Uh, but if they're if they come in and do a straight up cash grab, and then like they get a lot of bad PR from it, then they're like, okay, well, we're not gonna fuck with NFTs for like a long time. Um, so yeah, what have that, those conversations been like if you've been having them uh, and like, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think like my, um, the distribution company that signed on to I Live Here Now, Utopia Films, they signed on before I had ever talked about financing the movie with nfts and like they've been amazing because they've grown they've they've just had my back the whole way and i've even seen them take a, a little bit of shit for it like when they there was a deadline article like julie pacino is funding her movie with nfts and they shared it on their instagram page and they're kind of their niche they're sort of niche right now and kind of boutique like they're growing fast but um they don't even have like a huge following on Instagram and people were just shitting on it in the comments. They're just like, ah, oh, fucking NFTs, it's a scam. And like, I, we, I thought you, we liked you and now we're out. And, and so, um, but they've been amazing and they're the ones that I've been having those conversations with, because I, you know, now that we've pulled this off, they're like, all right, well, we have other films in various stages of productions that we think would do well in this space and they're consulting with me about it and they're asking the questions and I'm having conversations like we're having right now just about okay well well why why what's your what is your artwork like um who's your audience like what what is the point of this and so um they're the ones specifically that I've been having the conversations with there are other producers within the Hollywood system who uh, are I have not spoken with but I know that some of the other filmmakers in the NFT space are consulting with and so hopefully that goes well and um, you know we'll see like 
it, it's interesting to hear about projects that are in the works that are coming and then to not see those people actively in the space building the community their community ahead of their drop um so i don't right. know we'll see right yeah no it's definitely going to be very interesting to watch uh and i think we we're, we're just watching it play out amongst pretty much every vertical out there at this point um i guess that begs the question uh, how do you think blockchain will be used beyond just crowdfunding for filmmaking? I mean, I, I hope that it will be used in the way that I'm using it, which is to have to, uh, to bounce things off of an audience to make sure that the movie is the best version of itself that it can be, or just to yeah. use, to use the community as a gauge in some sense. So there's, so that it, it closes the, the potential of a disconnect. It's just it, it engaging with the community. Uh, I, th I think that that can have a huge impact and especially with studio films, like again, to, to what you said is if some studio comes in and is trying to, raise money for some shit film and they're, but they listen to the community is just like, no, 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 like that's not, we, we don't want that. We want something more like this. You know, I think, I think that's how it can have the, the biggest Im impact. And I, I know that that's like idealistic, but, um, but I believe in it and I'm going to, I'm going to, I intend on making all of my movies this way. And so it's great that we raise the financing for my movie we're shooting it in September and I view this as like, you view that as like the first big step. Cause now I have to go make a good movie, a great movie. And, um, I feel like I can, I feel like I, I can do that and I can do that with the support of the community. And once that, once the movie is done and out there and successful, you know, and, and has a, an in real life, uh, audience and life to it, then I think at that point, like the case study is complete. Um, and so the bulk of my work is still ahead of me. And that's great, you know, because that's now, now mm -hmm. I get to do what I know I can do, which is make a great film that I'm in full artistic control over. That's how we prove right. this, is, this is a method of, that, that can work. Right, no, that, that makes total sense. You know, and I'm I'm very much looking forward to it, uh, and everything that that you're you're working on, as well as the the film itself. You know, and and I know we're we're running close to the top of the hour, but um, I just want to talk about your your drop on Super Rare Modern Views. Uh, can yes. you describe it, uh, and you know what it is, and and what what you aim to achieve there? Yeah. So. Um photography has always been for me, like, especially recently has really been a tool for me to embrace my sexuality. Um, and, you know, like through, through my photographs and sharing my photographs and getting validation from my photographs with, which often deal with, you know, women and sexuality and, um, you know, the fact that I'm queer is expressed through these photos. Um, Modern Muse is a series that I'm going to drop on Super Rare of four photos that I've taken of my, my girlfriend who I've been with for a year, four photos that I've taken of her throughout the course of our relationship. And the drop is really a celebration of embracing sexuality. And there, there are these intimate portraits that I've taken of her that, um, you know, maybe a few years ago, I would, I would never even dream of wanting to share. Like I, I, I would be afraid to share them because they're unapologetic and they're proud. And so, um, you know, I, I got accepted to super rare like a few months ago and I didn't, it took me a while to kind of figure out what I wanted to <clears throat> have as my drop. And, um, I just, I have this collection of beautiful photographs that are intimate and personal and, and I feel like deserve to be <clears throat> seen in, in a sort of fine art light. And so that's, that's what this is. And, and Modern Muse is the name of the series and, and the first photo, the title photo 
is also called Modern Muse. And it's, it's one of the first photos that I took of my girlfriend. That's just this very fun, black and white, sexy photo. And it's really, when I got the film developed for that photo and I saw it for the first time, I, I really, it, it, a, a shift happened in the way that I make my art. It, 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 there's, it, it was the first photo that I took that was kind of like, oh, I can, I can be bold in my photographs and, and own that, but also in, in reality and, and in my life, like I can just be myself and be proud about that and okay. And like share that with other people. Like it's not this thing to be ashamed of. So um, that's, that's modern muse. And that will drop on Sunday on the 13th. Nice. Nice. Uh, congratulations. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I, thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come. Uh, before, before I let you go, uh, one last question. What's your favorite NFT? Mm. <clears throat> it's my wonk. I got to say, it's my wonk. I love the wonks. They made me an honorary <laughs> NFT. It looks like me. It. I just love her. I love her. And like, I mean, I have such a cool collection of beautiful photographs from all sorts of amazing, talented women in the space. And I, it's like, I'm so proud of my, of my collection, but I don't know, like whenever I see my little PFP wonk and just, it like makes me, it like tickles me in a, in a, uh, in a fun way. So yeah, I, I love my wonk. Amazing. I, I love that. I gotta, I gotta check them out. Cause I don't think I'm not very familiar with the wonk. So I'll make sure to yeah. check that out afterwards, but they're awesome. But yeah. And it's a, it's female led um, and they, they do great things. All right. Awesome. Um, if the audience, where should they go to find out more information about you and, and all the stuff that you're working on? Uh, so Twitter is at Julie underscore Pacino and keepers of the in dot art is our website for keepers of the Inn. Those are the best places. And like, I don't know, I, my DMS are always open, which they're, they're filling. <laughs> I, I like I like that. I like being accessible. I think the space is great because a lot of people are accessible. So my DMs are open. I I won't regret saying that, I don't think. Um, but yeah, any any questions, people can just DM me. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for everybody tuning in. And we'll see you guys next week. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great.